Hello, good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch. Thanks for coming back. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Um, my name is Jolie Denkinger. I'm a 2L at CU Law, and I'm the incoming editor in chief of the Colorado Technology Law Journal. Uh, this academic year, under the fantastic leadership of the current executive board and the current editor, Ethan Jeans, the Technology Law Journal published three print issues, uh, with a fourth on the way this spring. And it looks like people have been picking up copies of the journal uh, outside at the table. I think they're almost all gone. But if you didn't get a chance to grab a copy, you can view the latest issue and the, all the previous issues digitally online at our new and improved website. It's ctlj.colorado.edu. So uh, the issues are available online, as well as a newsletter. If you'd like to sign up for the journal's newsletter, that goes for um, alumni of the journal, friends of Silicon Flatirons, everyone is welcome to sign up there. Uh, I really look forward to working with next year's group of uh, talented students, and I also look forward to working with the Silicon Flatirons network to expand our access to uh, new ideas and continue to publish great articles. So thank you for uh, your support in all of that so far. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator of our next panel, Michelle Farquhar. Uh, Michelle's the leader of the communications group at Hogan Lovell's LLP in Washington, D.C., and she also co-leads the firm's technology, media, and telecommunications team. She has a long and distinguished history of practice in communications law, and I don't know if I can do it justice here, but I'll just give you a few highlights. Um, before joining Hogan Lovells as a partner, she served as chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau at the FCC, where she was responsible for the Bureau's implementation of the 1996 Telecom Act and numerous rulemaking proceedings, including uh, spectrum auctions, licensing and ownership issues, and uh, countless others while she was there. Previously, she was the acting deputy assistant secretary and chief of staff for the NTIA at the U.S. Department of Commerce and she was the Vice President of Law and Regulatory Policy at CTIA before that. And she has also served as Senior Advisor and Mass Media Legal Advisor at the Office of FCC Commissioner Irvin Duggan. During her years of service in government and industry, she's spoken extensively on wireless and other communications law issues. Um, and she has served on the Duke University Board of Trustees and St. John's College Board of Visitors. She's currently the Vice Chair of Duke's Sanford Public Policy School. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jolie. And I had the pleasure of working with Jolie last summer. She was an intern in our office and did a terrific five weeks of service with us. So thank you, Jolie. And it's wonderful to be here. Uh, first, I will introduce this very dynamic group of panelists. We had a little discussion over lunch, and, and I know it's going to be a very uh, good discussion here today at the panel. And it reminds me of what was said about Albert Einstein, that he was a, an exceptional thinker outside the box. And the reason was he knew everything that was inside the box. And I can say that certainly about all of our panelists. They know what's in the box. And so they're able to, to really think broadly about some of these issues. Let's start with very brief intros. Uh, first, we have David Clark, who already we heard from this morning. He is the senior research scientist at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and a leading developer of the internet. Then Christopher Yu who was a professor of law and communications and computer and info science at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm proud to say he also practiced law at Hogan and Hartson, and we overlapped for a year or two there. And John Nectarline, who is general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission and served in many high-level government posts, as well as practicing law at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. So those are our three presenters. Then we will have the discussants. We'll hear from them. And they will be Len Kelly, who is Senior Vice President for Global Public Policy in AT&T's External and Legislative Affairs Shop. Then Michael Gallagher, President and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association and former head of NTIA. And finally, Sharon Gillette, who is the Principal Networking Policy Strategist at Microsoft Research and former Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC. So in terms of the topic today, we'll be talking about interoperability and interconnection in the network industries, which is a fabulous topic uh, given how much is being written and debated about that right now, including some new proposed FCC rules to regulate ISPs interconnection practices. There is a lot of confusion about the terms themselves, what they mean, 
uh, between and dis distinguished from each other, interoperability versus interconnection, as well as what they mean in different contexts, especially the difference between a more managed network such as traditional telecom and voice networks versus the internet platform. So we'll try to sort out the noise in this area by looking at some historical background as well as some specific paradigms that reflect some of the shades of gray. So what I think we have learned about uh, in, in talking about this issue uh, a few minutes ago this morning is that there may be some shades of gray uh, and not necessarily a yes, no optionality in this space. And some of our presenters will talk more about that. So finally, let me launch this discussion by noting a recent BTAG report uh, that stands for the Broadband Internet Technical Advisory Group, for those that don't know it. It came out in November, and it was titled Interconnection and Traffic Exchange on the Internet. And I think David actually contributed to this report a little bit. And it defines interconnection as referring to that which network providers and how they attach and move traffic between one another, that there's no central authority managing internet interconnection, but it's governed by bilateral and multilateral decision making by entities who want to interconnect. So with that, let me turn it over to David. <coughs> when I first heard about this panel, it seemed to me there were a few too many buzzwords in the title because it had interoperability interconnection and innovation, and I sort of said blurk. But uh, Michelle asked if I'd talk a little bit about the history of interconnection, and then, which I will do, and then I, I want to make three points, which we're just teeing up further discussion. But let me see if I can explain what the, what the issues are surrounding this word interconnection. It's, it's sort of interesting to ask why the internet ex exists, which sounds like a stupid question, because it obviously does. But it's built out of a bunch of regions operated by different operators. And obviously, for the internet to exist, traffic has to be able to flow from one to the other. So there's, there's obviously some common interest in having this hooked together. And, and yet, the people who have to negotiate these interconnection agreements are often competitors. So the question is, why does this work? If you go back to the history of the telephone company, where there was a dominant player, in fact, interconnection was a highly regulated business, because the assumption was that absent regulation uh, interconnection would become a, a, a space of, of, of strategic behavior. But if you go back to the early days of the internet, there were more than one network and there wasn't sort of a dominant player. In fact, we worked pretty hard to try to make sure there wasn't a dominant player. And so it was mostly uh, by mutual interest that people said, yeah, I, I think it's useful for me to connect to you because my customers want to get to you and your customers want to get to me. And, and so physical connections were put in place between these networks. Now I want to point out in this context of interconnection and interoperation, it's the standards that define how that interconnection occurs, which I would call the standards that define interoperation, that make it possible for people to have that discussion about whether they want to interconnect. But interconnection is, in the end, an operational or a business decision. And there's no reason that my ISP should ever agree to connect to you. But of course, we need global connectivity. So if you look at the way the internet looked in its early days, there were firms that specialized in doing what, by telephone company analogy, would be called long distance. And so if you were a small ISP, you connected to one of these big guys. And of course, that was a service that you paid for. And you said, I want to plug into the rest of the internet. And they said, fine, give me some money, and I'll connect you to the rest of the internet. Uh, in internet speak, that's called transit. And you'll hear a lot of people tossing around the term transit. If you remember the first panel, Jack Waters was up here from level three. They're probably the largest transit provider in the world. And of course, people noticed that if I'm a sort of a big ISP and you're sort of a big ISP, why should we both pay him to connect us? Why don't we just run a wire between the two of us? And of course, that wire doesn't give you access to all the internet. It goes back to that original idea. I have customers that want to get to your customers. You have customers that want to get to my customers. Why don't we connect our customers together? And that was a different kind of business relationship. It was called peering. And as it emerged, the norm around peering was we would only do this if we saw value to both of us. In other words, it's useful to me to get to your customers, it's useful to you to get to my customers. And it was sort of an idea that emerged that it was so hard to negotiate over value in the internet because we couldn't figure out where the value flow was that we would just put the wire and we wouldn't pay each other. So there was this idea that it was sort of revenue neutral or to use other language, bill and keep or 
know, settlement free, but basically said, you know, I wouldn't do this unless it made my more value to my customers. And so when Verizon looks at a Comcast, they may be competitors, but they sort of look at each other. You sort of look like me, and I sort of look like you. My customers want to get to your customers. Your customers want to get to my customers. Why don't we just bypass this long distance business and directly hook together? So at this point, if you look at the internet, it's this incredibly rich mesh of peering connections with these transit paths as the interconnection paths of last resort. If you look at a modern network like Comcast, I suspect they, I think they peer with about 50 people. 50 other networks, it's not like two or three, it's 50. A vast majority of the traffic that leaves Comcast goes out through their peering connections. The transit is the path of last resort. If you're sitting inside Comcast and you're trying to get to, I don't know, Afghanistan or something like this, well, you know. Right, but, uh, Comcast peers with a lot of networks in Europe. They peer with networks in China. And it was sort of stable. And by the way, you wouldn't put in a peering connection unless it made sense for the two of you. So probably it's the right size. You know, you wouldn't expect to put in a connection and then under provision. Why would you do that? If you're going to under provision, why put it in the first place? So this was a fairly rich thing. I want to give you a little bit of intuition about this. I sort of, well, let's put in a wire. That's not actually what it looks like, right? We're talking about huge volumes of traffic. Uh, again, sort of picking on Comcast because they're sort of the poster child for a lot of debates here. I think they said that there's something like 10 places around the United States where they're prepared to peer with people. And we're not talking about a box, we're talking about a building the size of a city block where everybody co-locates their equipment and then they run connections. Many, many, many parallel fibers, huge capacity here, big engineering. These are called co-location facilities and things like that. So you don't want to think of this as let's run a fiber. It's a very complicated structure. They peer in multiple locations. That gives you traffic efficiency. It gives you resiliency in case New York City vanishes. And so it's a, it's a very rich space that's carefully engineered for efficiency, for resiliency, and so forth. Now, the thing that caught people's attention recently had to do with this emerging phenomenon, which was uh, high volume content delivery. And again, the poster child's in this place is Netflix. Netflix is delivering approximately one third of all the traffic that flows into a, a uh, consumer network like Comcast with uh, Google, YouTube being half behind. You know, they deliver about half that size. And Netflix is big enough that they just can't randomly, wherever they plug in, they cause an overload, right? I mean, there's, there's no connection. There's going to be no pre-existing connection into a network like Comcast that's big enough to carry one third of all the traffic flowing into the network. So wherever they connect, it has to be engineered. And Comcast, Netflix has gone through a series of design decisions. The way they do this in general terms is they provision fairly large computers. I mean, if you see these things, it's like racks, okay? I just saw a picture of one. I asked me offline what they look like. They're really wicked cool if you're an engineer. And they post the totality of all Netflix content, and they replicate these boxes all over the world. So when you go get a Netflix, it doesn't come from some machine in California. It comes to this machine that's been carefully positioned so it's sort of close by. And the real disputes over the last couple of years were the terms under which Netflix would attach to these access networks. And Netflix would say, well, you know, you're going to get this traffic somehow, so why don't you just let me plug in? And the answer is, well, should they plug in for free or should they have to pay? And of course, that's a business dispute. Okay, And without taking sides here, you can see that you can negotiate both points of view there. Uh, but the difference between this and peering was when Comcast and Verizon look at each other, they say, yeah, you sort of look like me. You're in the same line of business as I'm in. I can sort of understand what line of business you're in. When a Comcast looks at a Netflix, they say, you're in a really different line of business. So once again, this question comes up of, of well, to who's, who's, who's getting the greater value out of this connection? And so maybe there should be some money flowing. And some people said, well, we have a norm, which is it's revenue neutral. And other people said that doesn't apply here. And I think what we've really seen in the interconnection space is the erosion of the old norms without yet the emergence of what the new norms will be around negotiation. Now, this obviously caused some serious problems because during the period that some of these agreements were being negotiated, the traffic that was flowing from Netflix was flowing in over connections that were not adequately engineered. And the reason they weren't adequately engineered is people were figuring out what the right business relationship was that would justify the, uh, the in installation of the right capacity. And when the correct business deals were negotiated, uh, the congestion went away. And I can tell you that because 
one of the things that I've been doing, this is a collaborative project with Casey, who you may have met earlier if you were here in the morning, is to actually measure the congestion on interconnection links in the internet. We have some good tools that can do that. And if this was a half hour talk, I'd show you some cute pictures that shows the buildup of congestion as a result of these negotiations. And then there's a day when all the congestion goes away because they resolve the business issues and everybody can plug the wires in. And this, what this really tells you is that this is a space which is shaped by business issues, and the question is whether we can expect norms to emerge. Now, I'm going to run out of time, but three minutes. I wanted to just put in play three considerations that I think we should talk about here. One of the consequences of the disputes, the very visible disputes that arose as a result of Netflix negotiation, is a lot of people said, oh my God, is this possibly an issue that would be a barrier to innovation? And I'm going to bring in the third of the I words here. Okay. And people said, well, you know, uh, uh, Netflix is a big guy. They can negotiate with Comcast. That's, that's big guys fighting, so we don't really care. But what about the little guys? Uh, well, I want to point out that if you're doing a startup today, the problem that Netflix had to negotiate, which is, look, I'm delivering one third of all the traffic into your network. How are we going to work out the engineering so this is done efficiently? That's not the problem a small guy faces today. What a small startup today does is they say, oh, I need some computing. I'll go get it from you know, uh, Amazon Cloud Services or Netflix uh, or uh, Azure. Microsoft. Azure. Thank you. Azure. What? Azure. <laughs> Azure. Azure. Thank you. And if they want to deliver a lot of content, well, there are all sorts of content delivery networks out there. There's Akamai and Limelight and Footprint and so forth. And so that's the infrastructure on which innovation is occurring today. It's not sitting on the raw internet. It's sitting on that intermediate layer. And so if you want to know whether there are barriers to innovation, the place you ought to ask is whether that layer is healthy. If that layer cannot negotiate the interconnection agreements it needs, then you have an issue. But if that layer is healthy, then in fact, there really isn't evidence of a problem. And since I'm out of time, I'm just going to mention the other two issues. Not all that we build out of the IP protocols is the internet. And so we shouldn't just be talking about internet interconnection. There's a lot of interconnection of networks that aren't the internet. When you buy voice over IP today, and a lot of carriers will sell you voice over IP. Your mobile operator is moving the voice onto IP packets. Those networks are interconnected so that they can deliver voice. But those are actually different interconnections, sometimes even different physical connections, but they're certainly logically separated. And it may very well be that the business issues and the regulatory issues that arise with respect to those have nothing to do with regulating the internet. So be careful when you say we're going to regulate the internet. If that's literally what you do, you haven't begun to regulate the totality of the business issues that are shaping the future in this space. The third thing I want to point out, going back to a panel we had earlier, in the international regime, there's some really funky stuff going on around interconnection. Because it used to be that interconnection of the telephone system was a major flow of revenues into the developing world. And interconnection in the IP space is not generating those revenues. And there are a lot of operators overseas who are saying, wow, you know, if we could really just redo the way interconnection was done, then maybe I could turn those packet flows back into money flows. And I think that could be a very serious barrier to innovation. And in fact, not just innovation in the developed world, but innovation in the developing world. And if you, if you ask me a question later, I will tell you some stories up on about people who have described to me how they would like to see this look. But since the clock is well over time, I'm not, I'm not done. Thank you, David, for setting the stage. That was excellent remarks, especially the layer setting or level setting with respect to how the technology works and what some of the issues really need in that context. We're next going to go to Christopher Yu. He's got some slides, and he's going to offer some insights on the benefits and costs of interoperability, including some trade-offs that provide a framework for when interoperability is desirable or maybe not so desirable. Well, I'm delighted to be here, actually. I, I don't know if I should say this with pride or shame. Uh, my first time here was um, uh, 2004, where I wrote a response to the 2003 paper that Timu introduced the word network neutrality in our vernacular. I wrote the response, he wrote a response to my response, and those were the first, that was the first academic exchange about that whole issue. And I actually appeared here again writing about um, the kind of interconnection issues that David's talked about in connection with that work, and I don't have slides. Oh. Press to unmute video. <laughs> 
There we are. Okay, um, so I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I wanted to talk about a notion of optimal interoperability. And uh, it's really the notion to me is, is I start off talking about in praise about interoperability, and I realized I should put a question mark at the end of that. Because what I find is people generally talk about this as if this is a fantastic thing, everything should be interoperable, bigger the better, and everything should be wonderful. And uh, it, it, that, I think, was leading to some calls for to try to make certain proprietary networks or exclusive networks or ones that require you to pay money to be in or connect in different economic terms to try to make them level. So a good example to me is internet architecture, what Casey mentioned earlier about uh, but these private IP interconnected networks, which <coughs> often deal in very uh, different terms, I do think you see the dirt road concerns. You see people worried about its impact on other places, but also want to regulate the terms of their interconnection. I actually see residents of this in the original 2010 order of the open internet, where they talk about the virtuous cycle, but they only posit that as the only force that, in fact, accessing more and more is a good thing and it creates benefits. And it raises a question, is there anything on the other side? Apple iPhone, they talk about moving that, opening that up as a platform, even though it's rather closed. And one of the things um, I've noticed is I made it a point to pull some video game aspects because of the nature of the panel. And there's a wonderful empirical study that was just published in the American Economic Review that I'll show you. But video game platforms get criticism for, for exclusivity too. Now what struck me is that if this were the only thing, if it was only bigger is better, if the virtuous cycle were the only thing in play, then we would expect everything to be completely interoperable. In fact, that's not what we see, and either that's a tremendous mistake or we need to understand what other forces are going on here. Is exclusivity always a bad thing? And in fact, what we see is the very vibrant literature that suggests that's not the case. And so now we need to understand what is on the other side, and that's why it's optimal interoperability. What are the considerations that makes it so you might not want to be interoperable sometimes? So the way that the two big ideas that stalk in the minds of people about making all this completely interoperable is Metcalfe's law backed up by Moore's law. So Metcalfe uh, grew this idea, it was based on this observation that the number of connections goes up quadratically with the number of nodes. So look at it, it's a very, it's a very simple idea. If you have two nodes, you have one connection. Let's say we double those nodes. We now have four nodes. We actually have not a doubling of that connection, but six connections that emerge. And if we double it again, it's not a mere doubling of the connection, it goes to 28. And the overall relationship is the one described for an arbitrary number of nodes is n squared minus n over two. And that's a fairly straightforward idea. And Metcalf turned it into this lovely graph. What he suggested is the network value is determined by the total number of connections. That is, every connection adds more value to the network equally. In fact, that's going up quadratically. But adding nodes, assuming that you're just adding them one at a time, we would expect those costs to go up linearly. And at some point, this critical mass crossover occurs. And in fact, the wedge between benefit and cost will continue to rise the bigger and bigger you get. And this was the core insight behind Metcalfe's law. It, it holds great hold in the minds of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and a lot of policymakers. And what's interesting is um, it's badly misunderstood because, in fact, there are a lot of qualifiers like any general principle because it's, uh, it's much more complex than that. So one of the interesting, oh, okay, the other, okay, I've got this set up so I'm talking about the costs. And the other question is, are, what do we talk about costs? And they're talking about it being going up linearly. The other thing they talk about is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the claim about costs. They're saying the price of everything of electronic keeps going down. And so the idea behind this is that, in fact, we don't have to worry about all these new costs. In fact, we've got this wonderful reduction going on. And those, to me, are the two premises that say we, we live in this world, and if we just connect everything together, we'll be much better off. So what are the actual problems with this? So first, Moore actually did not st state the price of everything electronic keeps going down, and there's other versions, price of computing keeps going down. Um, that's actually not true. It was a claim about the number of transistors on a chip, on an integrated circuit. It was a very specific claim. And in fact, itself is just an observation, a prediction, and people talk about how the way we're making chips smaller and smaller is nearing a logical limit. And as Dave pointed out earlier, they're arguing over that. But more importantly, setting that aside, whether we're hitting the end of Moore's law or not, there's no reason we would expect a claim about a chip, about a chip to apply to batteries, as Casey mentioned earlier, or storage, or memory. And in fact, we have something called, for storage, 
uh, a separate law, and they talk about it. When they have different principles for networking, and they've all Crider's law and all these other things, and then the bloat issues and Worth's law. There's all these things going on, and in fact, some of them predict some things that are more uh, faster than Moore's law, and some predict them to be slower. But what's fascinating to me is there's no reason to think that that strategy of making chips faster would apply to other technologies that aren't necessarily chip-based, although as storage becomes more chip-based, you start to see these things move around again. The other famous thing is um, it doesn't apply to labor. Uh, a friend of mine, I saw, I saw this quoted once, Moore's law does not apply to digging ditches. And this is actually ties with an insight that Bill Baumol had, which is Baumol's cost disease, which is there are certain industries which do not respond to technology. They are labor-intensive industries. Education is often cited as one, but one that's easy. Live music performance has not gotten any cheaper. But live music performance participates in the same labor markets as, as electronic businesses. So their ranges are going up, even though their productivity isn't going up at all. And so what you start to see is that certain industries are very resistant to this idea, the ones that are extremely labor-intensive, and you can't just make a claim about this without knowing something about the components you're working with. The other thing is, it wasn't a claim about cost at all. It was a claim about transistors on a chip. It's agnostic about what the R&D cost it took to develop that or the production cost to make the chip. Now, um, the other thing that's interesting to me is going to Metcalfe's law Basically, they're saying more connections yields more value. In fact, there are a lot of reasons in the literature that we believe that might not be true. So one of my favorite ones is there may be an absolute number of, of connections you value. There's a psychologist that's uh, created something called Dunbar's number. The number of real relationships you can maintain with people in the world appears to be about 150. And actually, that's the average number of Facebook friends people have, perhaps not coincidentally. I mean, and they've done studies about this. Second, it's not true that you would, you would equally and randomly distribute your activity across all nodes. In fact, you know, I go to, I dial into to remote desktop access, I get my email server, my bank, you know, maybe a dozen places. And what they've seen is, we actually go to a small number of locations with high frequency. Uh, the average number of people that a Facebook user interacts with, that is not just posts, but interacts with in a month, is six. Uh, there's some studies that have shown the average number of people, people in the, back in the day, called on the phone more than once a month, was six. And there's a fairly small number, and it's not clear that you're going to have more value behind making it bigger, plus search costs, congestion costs, and other aspects. The other thing is this pure diminishing returns. Assuming that I have access to 10 e-commerce sites, you know, what's the marginal value of an 11th? Well, maybe to a 100th, to a 1,000th. And in fact, there's a nice literature that's grown up by looking at what happens if there's diminishing marginal returns. And in fact, the addition of a more, once you have access to a great deal, it's, they look at it as... Uh, the number one player, the number two player gets one half what the number one player gets. The number three player gets one third, fourth, and all the way down over one over n. And that changes the economics of this radically, where you don't see these, this constant growth in value. And what you realize is that, in fact, the conventional understanding of Metcalfe's law posits inexhaustible returns to scale. And of course, anyone who posits that, of course, gets these kind of absurd outcomes where bigger is always better. And that just is, we see observationally is generally not true, and now we're starting to get our minds around why. Now, the other thing that really is fascinating if you go into the engineering literature, is that this comes out of uh, software engineering and modularity, is that there are a number of trade-offs in generality. That is, um, I always think of when I had my first child, I walked into a baby superstore and found out that there were a bunch of things I needed to spend money on I didn't know existed before. And I was staring at the combination car seat stroller, which you take it and you pull it out, it pops in. And the bottom line is, money one knows you, you jointly optimize two things at the same time. You probably sub-optimize them both individually. It was a pretty good car seat. It was a pretty good stroller. But if you use them often enough, I just bought a car seat dedicated, car seat and a dedicated stroller. And what you discover is that's the trade-off between efficiency and generality. If you're writing a general print subroutine that has to work with a lot of things, it takes up more code, it does these. If you write it for one instantiation, it will be cleaner, faster, better. What it's not is flexible. And there's a bunch of examples we get through this. Second, there's the criticism of distributed platforms is that they don't, uh, that they go through drift. And this was a criticism of the IBM platform that, in fact, no one owned pushing it forward. And in fact, when I always think about this, IBM seemed to win the first round, but guess what? Apple's still making computers. IBM isn't anymore. And the problem is there's no technical leadership. No one has an ownership of the platform. And this criticism has been made of Android, particularly in the areas of security and other aspects where they realize that no one really is on top of it. 
Enhancing versus reducing competition. This is uh, the game example. This is an old, there is a, a very clear uh, theoretical literature says it is ambiguous, whether it's good or exclusivity is good or bad for competition. And uh, those are the cases, Shapiro is explicitly in network industries. Uh, Robin Lee's paper actually found that if you banned exclusivities, it would hurt the new entrant game platforms. Why? Because it takes about six months to write a new, if you're going to write for one platform, it takes about six months to write the next one. Most of the game sales happen within three months. And so the, the second and third platform would come online later. In the exclusivity world, they were able to negotiate with some of those game providers to be the first one and pay a premium to do it, but were happy to do it in the same way that uh, DirecTV pays the NFL for Sunday, NFL Sunday ticket to get adoptions and actually differentiate their product and make it uh, attractive. Uh, decentralized, there are other aspects that cut on the other side. Decentralized innovation has some value. I have an entire paper on this, which I won't go into. And then the last thing I would say is there are a bunch of mitigating institutions which people often overlook. You can see gateways between two networks, <coughs> even if they're imperfect, can actually push you towards a lot better outcomes. Think, remember when word perfect was everything and then we got the word uh, translator to get the documents, the install base didn't lock us in. Was it perfect? No. Was it good enough to get us off being stuck on word perfect? Yes. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I'll let you, that I'll leave you with is, it is possible that, I think that the debate is, is defined in polar terms. It's operable or interoperable completely. Uh, I actually think maybe the Android and Apple world may be optimal. Where there's clear benefits from the Apple device, because people love those things, because they're so well integrated, and uh, they do so many things. And we have, at the same time, Android as an open platform, as a safety valve from the standpoint of competition policy, from <coughs> other innovations. And in fact, I don't know that we need to think of this as an either-or choice. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, this is a term that is invoked to describe um, a, the, the supposed monopoly power enjoyed by a physical layer network that faces consumers. There's a consumer-facing network provider. And it's said to enjoy monopoly power vis-a-vis -vis interconnectors, not just negotiating leverage over who gets what share of the surplus, but monopoly power with all that implies, including dead weight losses and, and welfare reductions. And the notion is that any consumer-facing network provider has this terminating access monopoly, no matter how much retail competition it faces, and no matter how small a share of consumers overall it, it serves. And I, at the outset, I want to make it very clear that I'm talking specifically about this concept. I'm going to be zeroing in on small providers. And the reason is I want to keep this terminating access monopoly construct analytically distinct from plain vanilla monopoly concerns. And you can see a rise in any industry where um, a particular provider uh, achieves a, uh, a dominant scale. For example, DOJ didn't need to rely on the concept of the terminating access monopoly in 2000 when it blocked the WorldCom Sprint merger on the theory that WorldCom and Sprint combined would have occupied too much of the internet backbone market and would therefore would have uh, exercised market power. Let's go to the quintessential terminating access monopoly con um, uh, example. So this, this, this is a real public policy problem that arose around 2000. You see um, uh, this is the calling party over here, and he, he wants to call a particular person over here. And to do that, he has to go through his long-distance company. And let's say the person he wants to call is being served by a tiny little CLEC, a little competitive telephone company that serves only a few households in the same area where the ILEC operates. In that context, um, the CLEC was able to extract extremely high access charges from the long distance company, which the long distance company then more or less passed through back to its customer base. This is often cited as an example of how even very small providers can have terminating access monopoly power. Now, there, there are two things I want to note about this. One is that this all happened against a a, an intense regulatory backdrop. This long distance company had a regulatory obligation to interconnect with this little telephone company. And it also had a regulatory obligation to pay whatever tariffed access charges the CLEC was charging. And on top of that, the, even the calling party wouldn't get grief from the person that he called because he had to pay unusually high rates because there was another regulatory provision that required the long distance company to average out all of its rate, retail rates, and pass through these charges to its customer base overall. So to some extent, this market failure is really more of a regulatory failure. But to, there, that's not to say that there is not a terminating access monopoly problem potentially in this picture, even if you take the regulatory overlay away. Let's say that you do. And international calling might be an example of this. Um, where let's say that you have a CLEC that a very small company that is charging all interconnecting long distance customers, uh, interconnecting long distance carriers very high access charges. Even in that context, the long distance company might be willing to interconnect and pay, let's assume no regulation, might be willing to interconnect and pay these super competitive access charges so long as it can pass them through to its end user. If the end user would have no choice but to pay them because the telephone company is charging all of the competing long distance companies the same high rates. And th most importantly, this calling party has only one person that he or she wants to call in this context, and that person is served by that carrier. And so in that context, you can imagine a true terminating access monopoly rising in the absence of regulation because th this, this customer will be paying above cost rates and will be facing um, uh, debt weight losses in the form of not wanting to make as many calls as he otherwise would. What's going to be, turn out to be special about this is this is a market consisting of one person. And that's, that is, from the perspective of the calling party, he wants to reach that one person. That's why this is a special context. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, the question really is whether you can generalize this economic phenomenon to other contexts as well. And I don't, and I think it's very hard to do that. And I'm going to pick two examples of where I think it's particularly difficult. Think about the little cable company in, in this picture. So little MVPD, say it's um, a little rural cable company. 
that has maybe 1,000 subscribers. And the question is whether it has a terminating access monopoly that would allow it to extract anti-competitively high rates from, or, uh, from, from content providers. And the answer is no. In reality, what normally happens is that these smaller MPPTs end up paying money to the content providers rather than vice versa. I understand there's a, there's a set of regulatory issues here that may complicate the picture. Uh, we can talk about that later if that's important, but I want to get to um, the next con context, which is transit arrangements. How do I get the full screen on? Fine. Fine. That's fine. Okay. So here's, here's another con context in which this issue could come up. Think about the little ISP. So it could be a WISP somewhere in a rural area, or it could be RCN. He has only a tiny percentage of customers nationwide. Uh, you would think that if the terminating access monopoly construct were generalizable to all these contexts, then you would expect to see him exploiting, this little ISP exploiting that, that monopoly in order to extract super competitive rates for the receipt of inbound content en route to these customers. In fact, you don't see that. You see the little ISP instead paying for a transit relationship with a transit provider <coughs> who in turn provides both upstream and downstream content uh, for the little ISP. It's very different, obviously, for the big ISP. He uh, typically would have peering arrangements with other ISPs. And then finally, I am a terminating access monopolist in my own house. <laughs> so these are my kids, and they really want to read Teen Vogue. And presumably Teen Vogue wants to increase its readership, too, because advertising revenue would increase if they did. But um, turns out that in my negotiations with Teen Vogue, I was unable to extract monopoly rents from Teen Vogue to send its magazine into my house. Instead, I have to pay Teen Vogue money. And the reason for this is because this the relevant market isn't my kids. The relevant market is the subscriber base overall. And I obviously am not a gatekeeper with respect to that subscriber base. So I see my red light is on. I'm going to need three or four minutes just to wrap up. Um, so here, here are the key factors that may influence commercial arrangements. And as all the punchline will be, none of these have anything in particular to do with the so-called terminating access monopoly. Um, one, one, one set of issues that's obviously important is the total number of customers that a given network provider serves. If you're um, a very, very large ISP, if you have a very aggre high aggregate share of national eyeballs, uh, you are going to be able to strike better deals than if you're a very small ISP or MVPD. Uh, the amount of retail competition that each network provider faces is also relevant because the less retail competition there is for any given ISP or MVPD, the more credible its threat to, um, to, to balk in negotiations and to walk away from the table. Number three, the value of the potentially foreclosed communications to the consumers of the net, consumer facing network provider is also going to be important. ESPN is going to have more bargaining leverage than the tennis channel. And finally, competitive dynamics between the interconnecting parties um, are important as well, but they really influence more incentives to engage in discrimination rather than the ability to engage in discrimination. Again, if you're a very small network provider, there are very few circumstances in which you can exploit any monopoly power vis a vis interconnectors. So the uh, punchline here is the gatekeeper role of a consumer-facing provider is sometimes material to consumer outcomes and sometimes it's not. Um, it is obviously important, and this goes back to a caveat I, I mentioned at the beginning, it's obviously important where the consumer-facing provider is a monopsonist. I mean, if, if, a, if you have 80% of eyeballs, you are going to be able to extract some, anti, you're going to be able to extract some monopoly rents in some circumstances. But again, that's independent of the terminating access monopoly, which is supposed to be um, conceptually detached from the size of the provider. Um, I'm going to skip through scenario two. It's too complicated. I'm just going to go straight to scenario three. This, again, is the one context in which there is actually a, a, a market problem that regulation may need, be needed to address, which is the concept of voice-to-voice -voice calls. Why is that a problem? The problem is that the provider at the called end, the called party's provider, is a gatekeeper for this, the entire market. That's because the entire market is defined as the individual that someone wants to call. 
So um, I said that that was the punchline, but in fact, there are a few more punchlines. Um, <laughs> when you think about terminating an assets monopoly, you cannot have a monopoly in a vacuum. You can only have a monopoly with respect to a market. And so the question is, what is the particular market you're talking about? Are you talking about the market for video distribution? If you are, you might be talking about a market that's nationwide or global in scope. So the market as to which any given consumer-facing network provider has monopoly power um, may or may not be important to a commercial negotiation, depending on the context. Use the terminating access co concept with care. Don't confuse that concept with more general market power concerns. None of this is to say that regulation is inappropriate, again, in any particular consumer <coughs> communication space. There are independent reasons why you might want regulatory oversight. They have to do with plain vanilla market, market power concerns. They also may have to do with the network externality and the new, unique value of open platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, a lot of great food for thought from the presenters. Now we'll turn to the discussants, starting with Len Cowley. All right, thank you. Um, and first, let me say thank you to the presenters. These are three difficult presentations to follow. Um, and I, I think I would like to start mine with a question. To follow in um, what sense? Uh, to what? <laughs> difficult to follow in what sense? <laughs> no, that's, that's a very good point. <laughs> There's ambiguity in everything, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, they were great presentations. And so my question is, why do we trust the market to drive optimal outcomes in some cases, but not others in this internet ecosystem? At least that's what it seems like to me. Uh, in, in the last three years, I've been on a panel here at this table twice for interconnection conversations. And again, in Washington, of course, we're talking about net neutrality, which is a perennial favorite, right? Um, but the reality is we've been interconnecting networks without government regulation for a couple of decades. During this time, the industry has flourished, interconnection has grown in unimaginably good ways. With private sector leadership and with regulatory restraint, thousands of networks across the globe have interconnected, sometimes on nothing more than the strength of a handshake. And the cost of interconnection has declined as demand and capacity have grown. Um, yet we continue to talk about regulation, and, and we do so oftentimes on the terminating monopoly. And you, you wonder why, because I think John does a good job of Outlining, uh, outlining why, in fact, it might not be a very sustainable or credible argument in this context. And I think the reality is people are looking for a nice, solid reason to regulate, and there's nothing better than a monopoly, right, for that purpose. Um, but the reality is, too, that I think people are just uncomfortable having ISPs in this last mile and interconnection go unregulated. And perhaps the argument is, and as we have a conversation today about um, uh, the jurisprudence of innovation, is that it's a, an essential platform for innovation in the internet ecosystem, and that's why you should regulate it. So now I go to my question. Well, why some markets, why some aspects of the market, but not others? Because there are many other platforms within the internet ecosystem uh, that are more concentrated from a supplier perspective, are more ubiquitous, I, I would maintain are even more difficult to switch for consumers between providers, and are only growing in power over internet connectivity and operations. Uh, so when we start to think about interconnection and interoperability and the potential for regulation, we ought to recognize that the, the, this implicates much more than just networks. Because just think about how you use your smartphone today. Think about smartphone OS. Overwhelmingly across the world, two major providers. I mean, overwhelmingly. I looked at the stati statistics this morning. Same is true with browsers. Same is true with search engines. And think about how you use the internet during a, a an average typical day at home, at work, on the street, at the coffee shop, you may are probably using multiple different ISPs carrying the traffic during the course of a day, but you've probably only used a single browser and a single operating system. Maybe two if your employer during lunch hour is using a different uh, provider, a different OS and browser. Um, in addition, I wanted to highlight a relatively new capability that the browser companies have developed that I think is really significant to understand. Google calls its, its capability, I think it's speedy, S-P-D-Y. Microsoft offers the same capability. And what it does is it takes the, at the browser, encrypts information at the browser, all information, not just content, but even routing information, passes it to an ISP. The only thing an ISP sees is an address for a server that is owned and operated and controlled by the same company that provides the browser. So it's either a Google server or a Microsoft server. Uh, the ISP is blind to the traffic, essentially can't treat it in any way but neutral. However, the browser company de-encrypts it at the server. 
and they can do whatever they want. They can throttle some traffic, give preference to other traffic, fast lanes, slow lanes. It's almost certainly collecting information about origination and termination points. So why am I telling you this? Well, if you're an unaffiliated cloud company or a travel booking company or any number of other upstream content companies, you could be a little uneasy about, uh, say, Microsoft's competitive incentives and what it's doing with your traffic entirely free of regulatory oversight. Where's the interoperability, the transparency, their safeguards? Now, of course, I'm the guy from AT&T, so I am not arguing this should be regulated. But I am saying it's a, it's a platform for innovation that if you say, well, ISPs need to be regulated because they can throttle, they can block, they could do this host of hypothetical concerns. Well, it seems that in this case, the speedy type capability raises the same host of concerns. So I'm, I'm really saying we are on a very slippery slope. Now, until recently, there was a pretty good argument that the FCC would have a lot of trouble reaching the other points on the internet ecosystem, right? It was telecom carriers, maybe ISPs, but it gets very difficult to go beyond that. But that's not the case anymore. Many are looking at the Verizon decision, not just for overturning some of the net neutrality rules, but actually vesting enormous new authority in the FCC, and some even say the states, over the entire internet ecosystem. Um, and I think, I think David has touched on the need to start thinking about not just the network interconnection, but other layers for interoperability. Um, and I guess my message is, if we in fact believe that the inserted innovation benefits of regulating, uh, of, of interconnection and interoperability warrant regulating interconnection of networks, then why would we stop at networks? It has pretty far-reaching implications. What if, network, what if Netflix refuses to interconnect? What if Google says you can interconnect, but the ISP needs to pay me a fee? We've seen that as well. These things are going to distort competition. They're going to distort broadband deployment. And of course, the, the new proxy server capabilities I just described raise concerns. And I'm not just fear-mongering. These are very real issues. If you look at Europe, they're already talking about platform neutrality, digital neutrality, search neutrality. Um, in fact, Microsoft is part of a coalition in Europe calling for government officials to take action against Google given alleged abuse of its search dominance and the consequent harm to innovation. So if you go to look at the website for uh, fairsearch.org, a lot of the allegations made about what Google is doing from a search perspective really start to sound very similar to the hypothetical concerns that apply to ISPs. And the question here is, do consumers really want the government to referee all this? Do we think the government's even competent to referee all this, given how quickly the technology, commercial arrangements, and the like are evolving? Um, so some countries have been very open, and, and there was the illusion Dave made about regulating the internet and getting data termination charges. But I think we've always known that regulation, if invited into the internet ecosystem, is not going to stop at the networks. And now with Section 706 authority, it's pretty clear it doesn't have to. Great. So uh, for the law students in the room, this could be a very productive career. <laughs> um, and the, the conferences are very good, and there'll be plenty of work. Unfortunately, I don't think and I fear uh, that this isn't a very good outcome for consumers, investment, or innovation. So while the goal is to foster innovation, there are, we need to do so carefully as we look at introducing regulation into spaces that haven't been regulated before, and then where do you stop? Great. Thanks very much, Len. And before turning to Mike, I want to give a quick shout out to a book that I just loved called The Innovators by Walter Isaacson. If anybody hasn't read it, it's a, it's a great read. And it talks about the birth not only of computers, but of the internet and how networking technology grew in the US. And it talks in particular about the pivotal role of video games and uh, in, the, in the birth of the personal the computer <laughs> and why entertainment software is so important to it, innovation and the like. And I was mentioning that to Mike, and he knows all about that. But I, wanted, I thought that would be a good liftoff for your comments. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And um, I think I have the best job in this room. I literally am the luckiest guy. Um, and before I started with the few responsive thoughts to the presenters, I just thought uh, it would be really important to say thank you to Dean Weiser for once again putting on an outstanding conference. Thank you, Dean. So uh, listening to these presentations I had to, and looking at them in advance, I had to figure out like what is the role of the video game industry in this conversation? And uh, centered on the concept of why. Uh, 
We are the why all of this matters. Because no industry has more dynamically recreated itself to take advantage of the internet, to take advantage of the web, to take advantage of mobile apps uh, than the video game industry. And it can, it's a very creative, destructive, turbulent market, very risky, very entrepreneurial, highly technical, and it rides on top of uh, all of the discussion that we've had up to this point. And so I, I offer a few points as to the importance of that health from the video game industry perspective um, and why it might matter. First is the size of the market to a video game company today. The size of the market is all 7 billion people in the world. When I sit with the board of directors, the CEOs of the major video game companies, they see every single human being as, as, as an opportunity. Now, 2.4 billion people have access to the internet. That's according to Kleiner Perkins. 1.4 billion of them have smartphones. According to the GSMA or GSM Association, there's gonna be another 1 billion smartphone consumers, not just smartphones, but consumers added in the next 18 months. And today, we have 1.4 billion gamers and an $87 billion worldwide industry. So that's the size of the market from the industry perspective, which second point um, is includes the entire world. Um, for the companies that are US-based members of ESA, Microsoft, Electronic Arts, and others, over half of their revenues come from outside of the United States. Their ambitions and their goals and the return on their investment is based upon these network of networks and their ability to bring consumers together to have a communal experience in, in these entertainment products that they make. Second, uh, related to that, is the international members of ESA, which include PlayStation, Nintendo from Japan, Nexon from Korea, Ubisoft from France, Tencent from China, is they also have that view and they just happen to value the US market enough to be a member of ESA and to uh, have had some of them very good strong history in this market. The development studios, and this is a very important point because I'm going to close with it, are worldwide. The talent to make great video games and to bring them to market, and the average wage for a video game industry job is $95,000 a year here in the US. That talent pool is worldwide and it, and it is very, very competitive amongst them. It's not a uniquely US resource. So it brings to the third point, which is when it comes to engagement, the value of the network of networks, the internet, the web, and social apps, or excuse me, apps on uh, mobile, to connect huge numbers of people with incredible speed. Several examples. Um, Riot uh, is a company that makes a game called League of Legends. League of Legends, and this is data as of like a couple of weeks ago, has 67 million people that play that game uh, in a month, 27 million a day. 27 million people are playing League of Legends in a single day. Minecraft, I'm sure everybody with kids in this room is very familiar with Minecraft, has 100 million registered users. 100 million, so these are the law of large numbers. The ESA, trade, our trade association has a trade show, it's called E3. Last year we had 53 billion media impressions off the show. Half of those were international. Twitch, I mean in this room are familiar with Twitch, raise your hand. So a very small number, um, 100 million people watch Twitch or tune in or go to Twitch per month. 100 million, not obviously not everybody in this room. 100 million are going there and what they're doing is watching each other play video games. They're watching one another. They're not watching like YouTube. It's live, I watch you play a video game. Amazon bought this company for $1.1 billion. It didn't exist five years ago. But 100 million people, that's twice as many as last year, which leads to eSports. This is a notion of there's a video game competition in an arena, and then it's streamed out to the world. Um, the most recent eSports competition for League of Legends had 32 million people uh, tune into it, 8 million that watched it continuously at the same time, and that's more people than watched the deciding game of the Stanley Cup Finals. So this is all happening all around us. It may be from people that are younger than the, in this room, but that's where the entertainment value is. That's where the reach is and is again worldwide. Two more quick points. One is on mobile, it's pervasive. And I think each of us have our own stories and experiences and in, in where the industry is touching us. 63% of the revenue in both app stores, Google and Apple, is video game revenue, 
And then uh, the final point is this, is it's, th all of this has thrived in this environment of allowing people to innovate, allowing creators to create, and allowing consumers and creators to connect with one another. And it's incredibly vibrant, it's incredibly exciting, but tomorrow's not guaranteed. We only continue to have success in this country as long as we get it right. And the imperative on those that make policies couldn't be heavier from our industry's perspective. Because we get it right, we get more of these fantastic jobs, the opportunities to create entertainment experiences to define what entertainment means around the world is in our hands today. So it's delighted to be here and, and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mike. And we'll turn finally to Sharon. Thank you, Michelle. And also thank you to the whole Silicon Flatirons team for having me here today, Dean Weiser, to Anna, to all the students who make this conference happen. I uh, want to be sure that we're careful in this conversation. Um, I'm really building a lot on John's remarks. Um, I'm happy to respond to Len's comments later in the discussion. Uh, so I just want to be sure we're careful to distinguish between what we could call the terminating monopoly itself and the terminating monopoly problem. So what's the difference? What do I mean? First of all, terminating monopoly itself is a shorthand for a straightforward and uncontroversial observation about the structure of networks, namely that a network operator that connects to a single homed end user, and that single home part is very important, uh, it provides the only path through which other network participants can reach that user. So in the historic voice market that John Slides addressed, uh, the other network participants were long distance carriers or IXCs, and the network operator that provided the terminating path was a LEC or a local exchange carrier. Today's IP-based market, the names are different, the concepts are the same. The network operator that connects to the end user is either a mobile or a fixed broadband access provider. Uh, I'm mostly going to use the term eyeball ISP to describe that. It's the, the, the uh, ISP who serves eyeballs, in other words, which, by the way, WorldCom, and, and, uh, WorldCom was not an eyeball ISP, so I, I'm a little confused by that analogy. But. Uh, and then the other network participants are transit networks and what the FCC likes to call edge providers. Uh, that's their shorthand for the providers of content, application services over the Internet. Uh, this is the only time in my remarks I will mention Netflix. Microsoft is also an example of an edge provider. So while the network operator's monopoly path to the, to the single homed end user is a fact, how big of a problem that is depends on other market context. So suppose that users have perfect information about how their experience is affected by their network operator's behavior towards other network participants. Suppose further that users have plenty of other choices in network operators and a frictionless ability to switch among them. Finally, suppose that other network participants can take or leave the ability to reach the users of any particular network operator. Under these circumstances, a network operator would not derive much power from its single path to the end user. And by the way, we didn't coordinate on this, but these are very similar to that final slide that you had up about the, the characteristics. So in those circumstances, there would still be a terminating monopoly, but not a terminating monopoly problem. And policymakers would, fang, frankly, they would yawn. Unfortunately, these are not the circumstances that surround broadband access ISPs in the US today. There's very little transparency about how the actions of ISPs towards transit or edge providers affect the end user's experience. Overall, consumer ability to switch ISPs is low. Many consumers simply lack competitive alternatives, while for others, switching costs are too high. For wired broadband, about two-thirds of U.S. households have either no or only one ISP that offers service at the speed threshold adopted by the FCC last week. And that's according to a chart in the, in the report that they put out. Uh, it's based on FCC and NTIA data. In mobile, churn for U.S. operators is the lowest of any region in the world, and that's based on strategy analytics data for Q3 2014. Mobile subscribership in the U.S. is highly con consolidated. Uh, for all the reasons I think John was mentioning about furthering uh, consolidation being a concern. Uh, the most recent FCC wireless competition report shows that since at least 2008, the national mobile industry, HHI, has remained above the highly concentrated threshold and it keeps going higher. We also need to consider the provider motivation question. Uh, while today's edge and transit network providers are not subject to a regulatory mandate to deliver traffic to and from the customers of eyeball ISPs, they're nonetheless strongly motivated to do so. Edge and transit providers want to reach all customers and potential customers, especially given the positive network externalities for edge services 
that involve interpersonal communications, like Skype or Facebook or so many others. This is the point-to-point -point type of communications that John was describing. In addition, some edge providers are investing in building their own shorter physical paths to connect directly to eyeball ISP networks as a way to reduce latency. For both reasons, the more customers the eyeball ISP has, the stronger the motivation of edge and transit providers to interconnect with them to reach their subscribers. In contrast, the eyeball ISP's motivations are perhaps more conflicted. On the one hand, they want to offer value to their customers by delivering access to the full gamut of Internet apps and services, including the latest innovations. On the other hand, some of those innovations will compete, at least partially, with services they offer themselves. So the incentive for anti-competitive foreclosure is present today in a way that it wasn't when pure long-distance carriers terminated voice calls to pure local exchange carriers. And Microsoft, we know this firsthand because we've experienced it, particularly in jurisdictions that don't have net, neut net neutrality rules. Some ISPs have discriminated against Skype in a variety of ways. We detailed them in our comments to the FCC. Apparently, the fear was it would erode voice or SMS revenues. On the other hand, a few mobile ISPs, including in the U.S., have embraced Skype as a driver of data plan adoption and revenues. So what does all this add up to? Three conclusions. First, the circumstances of the U.S. broadband market do strongly empower eyeball ISPs to exploit their monopoly path to their customers. In other words, today's market facts, unfortunately, do give us a terminating monopoly problem. Second, U.S. policymakers aren't yawning, and nor should they be. It's their job to foster competition and innovation. This mission underlies their longstanding commitment to net neutrality rules, and now, so we hear, to interconnection dispute resolution as well. While net neutrality has traditionally been concerned with what happens to traffic traversing an ISP's network, interconnection governs how the traffic enters the ISP's network in the first place. Both are relevant to how an ISP may try to use its terminating monopoly to foreclose competition and innovation. Whether using their control over the doorway or the hallway, ISPs may favor their own services over those of edge providers they perceive as a threat. The incentives for this kind of discrimination would seem to be increasing as ISPs integrate into ever more services and as Google, which is traditionally thought of as an edge provider, becomes an eyeball ISP. ISPs may also tilt the competitive playing field among edge services, including among those that they don't perceive as a competitive threat to themselves. If you go to buy shoes and the salesperson keeps trying to sell you a brand of shoes that doesn't actually fit your foot, you might quickly figure out that the brand's commission is more important to the salesperson than your satisfaction as a customer. It's pretty easy to go to a different shoe, st shoe store. It's not so easy to switch ISPs. If yours chooses to, for example, offer better interconnection performance to an edge service you don't want to use instead of to a competing edge service that you do. Assuming, that is, you're even able to figure out that it was something your ISP did that changed the performance of your favorite edge service. Third and finally, while policies to address the terminating monopoly problem are an important treatment for the symptoms, so are policies to address the underlying disease. I look forward to discussion, and I think we we'll, may especially be on the next panel, but we'll see, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, of how industry and policymakers together might facilitate multi-homing, reduce switching costs, encourage competition, <clears throat> and help consumers understand how their online experience is affected by their ISP's behavior towards uh, transit and edge providers. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And we have a few minutes for intra-panel discussion before we turn it over to the audience and the student questions. Uh, John, I know you want to make a, a couple of remarks oh, and we'll sure. give everybody an opportunity. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you, Sharon. The, um, Sharon distinguished between terminating access monopoly and the terminating access monopoly problem. I want to distinguish between terminating access monopoly and any old regulatory problem. Um, the mere fact that you have a problem doesn't necessarily emanate from the very specialized economic concept that people invoke when they talk about the terminating access monopoly, which is um, independent of some of the market concerns that you've addressed. So for example, high switching costs, um, lack of transparency, uh, no competitive alternatives, all of those are independent of the concept of the terminating access monopoly. And if those are the problems, then it would make sense to tailor regulatory solutions to those problems rather than to, I think, confuse the discourse a little bit by talking about a terminating access monopoly. Um, it, Sharon 
um, said something very important, which is that all, e even when you see a terminating access monopoly, the premise of it is that the um, provider's customer is single-homed. Single-homed simply means <coughs> that they have no other way of receiving the incoming communication. Um, I had been assuming for purposes of my presentation that uh, everyone is single-homed, but of course it's much more complicated than that because even though in the traditional voice telephone network people were in fact single-homed, there weren't cell phones when I was growing up and you basically had one line into your house. Um, these days, uh, you likely have multiple paths uh, to you. Uh, so, for example, you can uh, get access through your mobile phone, you can get access through your wired connection, you can get access at work. Um, I don't want to overstate this point, and it's obviously a little contentious, the ex extent to which pe consumers have alternatives like that. But I, I do want to just point out that in some respects, even in the narrow context where I was stipulating that the terminating access monopoly problem was real back in the PSTN <laughs> world, um, some of the premises for that are no longer as solid as they used to be, in part because there are, in some context, multiple paths to get to, um, to end users. Um, finally, I just want to, I want to say a couple words about market concentration. I mean, there are two, we've been, in part because, you know, we, it's, it's important to simplify things in, in a setting like this. We, we've been conflating what most people regard as two different markets. Um, one is the market for fixed line access into residential neighborhoods. The other is uh, the market for mobile uh, broadband service. Um, th those are probably still formally separate markets. They probably nonetheless exercise some competitive discipline on one another. Um, we have in this country four national wireless providers. Um, on some level that is concentrated. Um, on, but it kind of depends on your overall perspective. I think we have a lower HHI number in this country than most developed countries have. Um, I think the norm in Europe, I could be wrong about this, I think this, the picture may have changed since I last look at, looked at this, but it is not uncommon to find countries where you only have three, um, three major providers. Thanks, John. Christopher or David, any? Oh, I, I'd, love, I'd like to thank Jonathan for mm -hmm. highlighting some, a point I've been trying to make for a long time, which is with respect to a phone call, you have a market, a geographic market of one household. That is different than, say, an ESA provider. You're, and I think you know, I used to teach my students with shoe manufacturers. If you're a shoe manufacturer, you'd love to get national distribution. You'd love to get international distribution, which is what ESA has. But what matters is not getting to any particular customer, but getting to 80, 90, as much as you can, and compare that to your minimum efficient scale. Can you make a go of it? The real geographic scope of that market is national and international. And so when we look at the ability to foreclose, the question is not do you control this customer for a phone call, but how much of the national market for this game do you control? So we have a tendency to look at local companies and say, well, there's only one or two options for last mile distribution. It must be a duopoly or in whatever, how you want to do it. From the standpoint of someone who's not trying to reach a particular customer, but a type of customer in a retail basis, it is not true that their ability, the fact that there's only two options for an end user in the city of Philadelphia is going to translate into market power. If, let's say, the cust if you control 10% of the market nationally, the chance that you could unilaterally foreclose just isn't there. And so it makes you really have to think about carefully who the market is and who you need to get to. And I think your presentation teased that up very, very nicely. Uh, one other thought is um, the other thing that worries me about interconnection is, you know, and I will I use the word Netflix. I apologize if you want to stay away from that. But what strikes me is to the extent to which Netflix is getting a better deal from the billions of dollars of risky forward contracts they took in content, they deserve every penny of it. And there is what we're trying to separate, and they are, in fact, doing a product called Open Connect, which David alluded to, to actually leverage their market power because they have a very highly demanded service. That's wonderful. It's wonderful for consumers. What I want 
to see companies doing is trying to outdo each other by out investing, whether it's in services or the networks they need to deliver it. And to do that, there, if there are any anti-competitive rents, and there's a real problem, and I'm borrowing from Mark Cooper in a large sense from a presentation he made at a, a, something I a, a program I organized last fall, we have to be able to separate super competitive returns that are the result of, not super competitive, but uh, the excess returns to fund investments that people made, taking into account the risk that they made and the wild ride that Netflix had from 14 bill to 1 bill to 25 bill, all uh, in terms of network capitalization and separate out any rents that are anti-competitive. Now, the problem with that is, how do you tell the difference? And do we have, and I say that from a standpoint where I don't believe any mechanism will perfectly separate the two. And then the question is, which will do a better second best job, arm's length negotiations through a business relationship or a regulator trying to sort out the two? And um, the, to, regardless of how you answer the question, I do think the question of moving into the interconnection world, that is the question. And that segues nicely to David. And then we'll turn it over to audience questions. I think that interconnection is, is sort of a, oh, it's got its 15 minutes of fame right now because uh, this whole issue of Netflix sort of brought it up. But you asked, the fundamental question, which is why do we think that the market can drive efficient outcomes in some cases and not others, and why do we trust the market? And I think, I think, you know, I don't want to pretend I'm an economist here, but in some sense, the answer is, you, you look at the if you look at the larger constraints imposed by the ecosystem. So, if you look at interconnection today, as I said, two companies can agree to peer, but if they don't peer, what they do is they fall back on transit. So. If Netflix goes to Comcast and says, I'd like to connect you, and Comcast proposes a price that's 10 times transit, what happens? Netflix buys transit. And so there are constraints on the bargaining here that actually limit their ability to exploit that kind of pricing. And this, this whole issue of the terminating monopoly, I think if you look at the richness of the behavior you see in this space today, you realize perhaps voice is not just the right analogy. So let me give you a different one. As uh, you know, Casey turned red this morning on her slide about this issue of uh, 300 gigabytes a month. You can only watch an hour a day of, of HD per person. And if you look at the wireless world, the wireless world has very low usage caps. Now, that's not discriminatory behavior. They do it to everybody. Okay. So, you know, but it's certainly a barrier to innovation. What do the consumers do? The consumers have figured out how to deal with this. They don't allow, download the movie until they get to a Wi Fi. Okay. And so, you can ask, well, are the wireless people happy about this or sad? And what's interesting is that five years ago, six, six years ago, I talked to uh, some guys selling devices like Nokia. And they said, well, we could put a Wi-Fi device in here, but no, no carrier would ever sell it because they don't want offload. <laughs> <laughs> they want to own every one of those bytes. And they was, my God, we can't deliver the product if we have to do that. We love, we love offload. We just want to try to get what we can out of it. So, we, we actually see all kinds of behaviors in moving, including consumer adaptation to deal with the barriers that otherwise would keep things from coming to market. So I, I, I think the richness of the space is empowering. And I think that issues were going to rise and fall. And basically, we should, we should not be focused on any one of them like interconnection, because there's no reason to think that next year, that's the thing we're all going to be fighting over. And you know, there are a lot of these big players, the Google. Notice the issues with Google do not manifest using the word interconnection, okay? They have a global footprint. They don't have to accept, except hooking their YouTube caches up, which case we've already been there, because that's the problem that they're what, number two behind Netflix. And so I think it's really to say, are we seeing circumstances evolve in this ecosystem where the actors don't have alternatives that can be used to discipline the behavior of the other parties. And what we ought to be working for is a richness in that ecosystem that, that sort of keeps those things in place. And if we have them in place, then in some sense you can just let the people go bargain about it. But that's a much more general comment than saying, well, we should, we should get involved in the negotiation about interconnection, because I'm willing to bet you a year from now the fight has moved someplace else. I don't know where it is going to be. You know, maybe everybody will gang up on Google, but. Uh, you know, we, we get, you got to you got to go where the, you got to go where the market constraints don't seem to be uh, rich enough that the thing works out. And uh, part of what's powerful about the internet is the richness of those constraints.
I hate the usage caps. Michelle, yes. I just want to, one statistic I want to respond to before we go to sure. questions. It's this concept that the FCC has now reclassified broadband as 25 megabits and up. And so there's a certain number of customers in the country who have but one choice. I, I, I just wanted to highlight that's of little analytical value when you, when you think of the fact that, um, and the reason is this, three quarters of customers in the country have multiple choices, two, three options for 10 megabits. at and provides millions of home service that tops out at 24. So, you know, if you use it for an analytical tool, you're saying in a market where the cable company may be providing 25 megabits per second and at and is providing 24, are you really, is that really a monopoly market? Um, and then that ignores the, the overlay of four nationwide carriers and oftentimes a fifth carrier providing service in the market, wireless carriers, providing wireless broadband. And just to tie back to my comments, compare that to the mobile tablet OS market. Two companies over 90% of the market, and these are statistics I pulled off the internet, but these are basically certainly ballpark. If you look at browsers, 68% top two browsers, you're up to 88% with the top three. If you look at sales of smartphones last year, 96% two OSs. Um, so if you're really looking at concentration, I, I mean, I really love what you said, Dave, because I think you gotta, you gotta look at the broader ecosystem and say, well, what are the constraints of these players? Are these really relevant numbers? But if in fact, you think they're relevant in the ISP context, then you gotta start saying, well, are they relevant for these other platforms? And, you know, maybe, maybe companies are out there ready to say, yeah, they are relevant for other platforms and we ought to start extending the look and reach of our regulatory framework. I'm not there, but I do highlight we are on that slope. Right. I just want to respond to that. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, you know, John made the same point. It's, it's really important not to confuse plain old market power with a terminating monopoly problem, right? And so, yeah, there can, anywhere there's competition, there's going to be any competitive concerns, right? Any market's going to have competitive concerns. But it, as John reinforced too, you know, consumers have to single home to create a terminating monopoly. I routinely have two browsers open on my computer. It is trivial and free to download more of them, and it is a click to switch between them. It is not change of a contract. It is not moving a SIM card. It is not porting a number. It is a click. And so uh, the switching costs really are very trivial with software-based products. And also consumers do multi-home a lot more than they do. <laughs> with I, I take it that many people have a, a wire and a wireless, but with the data caps on wireless, it's really not a substitute as you were pointing out with the Wi-Fi analogy. Although I'll point out the Wi-Fi is really just an, a wireless extension of a wire line. Of course. So Casey's point still applies to that as well. Um, so anyway, there can be anti-competitive behavior in any market. That doesn't make it an example of the terminating monopoly problem. Well, let's go ahead and move on to audience questions. We need a student, I think, first. That's hard to look like this. <laughs> Uh, Find somebody who looks young and. Chris? The guy in the suit is a student. He's a well dressed one, though. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no. Wait, you you can just shout, that works. I heard you. Do you want me to respond to that? 
<laughs> okay, what, what the point is, but before you, you're welcome to go on, but when, when, when we've been talking about discriminatory practice in the context of FCC's about network neutrality, it was that they're treating some people differently than others. And that's, I think that's the point is what I'm saying is when, when Cox limits their customers to 300 gigabytes a month, they do it to everybody. And if the, if you come across an ISP that says, well, I'm not interested in offering more than three megabits per second to any of my customers, the service sucks, but it's neutral because they do it to everybody. And what I'm saying is not all of the harms arise because different people are being treated differently. Now, the question about low income people, I think is a fascinating one. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be snarky here, but of course, low income people suffer from all kinds of disadvantages, right? And you know, so I have actually, I know actually know somebody who's, I know people who have only a mobile device, and what do they do? They go buy a, they go to McDonald's, you know. Or, or, so yeah, people, people have different options depending on their, or the, yeah, they may not have Wi-Fi at home, but there are lots of other ways to. Some people can only go to the library, okay. But I, th I think that's a different dimension than the kind of discrimination that arises in the contract, the context of neutrality. I can offer a lousy service, but it's neutral. And I think those are, the point I'm trying to make is, not all of the, not all of the harms arise because of neutral, neutral treatment, lack of neutral treatment. Some of them arise because the service sucks. I can problematize it even worse, though, which is zero rating systems on mobile devices. Think T-Mobile Music Freedom. Your music doesn't count against your data cap. You've made one app cheaper. And in fact, uh, what we are in a funny world, consumers like that. It often lowers the plan they can purchase because they can shed some of their data on the music. It doesn't count. And what's fascinating to me is in the developing world, this is considered an essential deployment uh, strategy because in, on an initial basis, they make it cheaper. And for them, it, that's absolutely critical. And you see things like Wikipedia zero, Facebook zero. And there are some concerns about how that's going to change adaptive behavior. My reaction is it'll be like AOL. They will move past it. I don't think people get stuck there. And they ups people get part of the internet tend to move. But the other thing is on the initial end, they also get some revenue from the advertising basis. And it actually helps them build out their networks. And they're saying anything that makes it cheaper is better. And so it's a complicated issue where you see things like that to start to solve some problems. And for them, they say, um, we actually need connections and the quality of the connection we have to work with in the first order, the, their goal is to get the four billion people who aren't connected on, and, as opposed to working with the connections of the quality of the people of three billion who are already on. So we take the risk that the next generation of users in the developing world equate the internet with Facebook. <laughs> I would say that, that they're online and maybe they'll get past it. So one of the interesting projects that some international people are doing is looking at Myanmar. Maybe. Myanmar is actually a virgin mobile territory and they're, trying to, and they're being deployed that way and they're trying to see if they get stuck. And my, you know, you can conduct the story. Actually, there was a, the question is we can create hypothetical harms or we can actually deploy and see what happens. My reaction is the AOL story is the more likely, the prodigy death, the AOL death is the more likely one. But the question is should we stop these technologies from deploying ex ante or could we step in after the fact if those, if they get stuck there, are there other policies we can use to get them unstuck? Time for, yes, up top. Somebody might take a second. question for me or does somebody yeah, else want to answer? Yeah, it sounds like that. <laughs> 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 if I want to repeat the question. Yeah. So that, yeah. Uh, one of the problems we have in the internet today is what's called the distributed denial of service where uh, if you would like to be really malicious and say flood MIT with packets because you're mad at us, you can go rent time 
on an assemblage of a few hundred thousand computers that some bad guy has infested and set up so that on command they'll all dump traffic toward MIT. Uh, this happened to us. It's also happened to a lot of other people too. But we noticed it. And the question is, what are your, uh, what are the obligations of the various players in this space? Let me, let me go slightly differently. Um, there are ISPs, internet service providers, they're not sources of distributed denial of service attacks, but apparently all they do is originate spam. And there is no obligation to interconnect to these people. And in fact, some ISPs have been driven out of business because nobody else would interconnect with them. And they've claimed that sending spam, this is a US point of view, they've claimed that, that sending unsolicited bulk mail is free speech and anybody who won't interconnect to them is exercising censorship and you can see how that plays out. But the answer is, yeah, there have been, there have been ISPs that have been shunned out of business because all they seem to be doing is hosting spammers. There's no obligation to interconnect. Now, with respect to DDoS, there's a really serious problem here, which is those guys, the attackers, are trying very hard to disguise their traffic as uh, legitimate traffic. And if you're sitting in the middle of the net, you know, you're a long-distance carrier. You know, you're, it's very hard to tell until you get close to the target of the attack what's actually going on. So in terms of mitigating the problem, it's actually hard to put an obligation on them because it's very hard to understand how they would fulfill that obligation. And since the attacks are originating from machines that are distributed around the world, it's not that you can target some evil ISP and say, you know, if I just disconnect you, the problem goes away. So that doesn't really solve the problem with respect to DDoS. We've got to think about DDoS differently. But the anti-abuse people who are trying to identify IP address blocks, uh, domain name blocks that are associated with abusive email, they are actively getting out there and saying, let's send these guys out of existence. Let's deconnect them. And this leads to all kinds of disputes, as you can imagine. They often respond by DDoSing spam house. And it's Mike? Yeah, I would just add that uh, the denial of service attacks are, are profoundly damaging. Um, many in the room might be familiar that both Xbox and PlayStation were hit with those from basically Christmas Eve through New Year's. And that's a peak period of time economically for those businesses. And it was a, a very significant uh, challenge. It's been described to me by several of the experts that we've worked with is like if you own a shopping mall and you have all of your security assets in place and you're doing everything right to make sure that mall works and then suddenly there are 200,000 10 year olds that encircle your mall at the doors and try to get in and somewhere in there there's a legitimate customer that's trying to make it. You can't tell, you can't differentiate and you also just can't impose a discipline on all of them because they're not deserving of that treatment and obviously most of them are international in reach. So uh, it's a very complex problem, it's one we do need to solve. And, and, and can I offer, I think your question try to get at this is, um, do the regulations get in the way of the ability of the private sector to respond? We have to recognize the threat is constantly evolving. The private sector needs the flexibility to evolve as rapidly. We need the ability to share cyber threat information, coordinate response. We also need limitations of liability when we do those things. So the one thing, I, I think the question's right on point, we have to be careful not to impose restrictions out of all the best intention that, that hobbles the private sector's ability to respond, but give the private sector the tools to flexibly evolve a response. But every rule that's been passed in this space, and I don't know this rule, but I assume that this will be true, has an exception for protecting your network. And so the legal basis will be there. The problem is someone's going to argue that your decision to do so is pretextual on an attempt on another basis, and we're back in the soup. I mean, that's where we're going to end up. Well, thank you very much. I wish we had a lot more time for this panel. Uh, wonderful <laughs> panelists. And thank you. Yeah, definitely.